Welcome to Illuminati Coast to Coast and tonight I'm going to interview the world famous Dr. Christopher Hyde of New Falcon Publications. Dr. Hyde has published 25 books, CDs and DVDs. He has had his works and books translated into five languages. Bestseller in Germany. He has two master's degrees in experimental psychology and physiology. He has two PhDs, clinical psychology and human behavior. He is a student of the well-known and world-famous Dr. Francis Israel Rigardi. Today he's here live on Illuminati Coast to Coast. Dr. Hyatt, thanks for being part of the program. Thanks for coming on. It's a real honor to interview you. And uh, your current interests, you said, are Kundalini Tantra. Is that correct? Yeah, I've been doing that, uh, working with Dr. Rosa Rigardi since 1970. And now we're doing what is called Rudy, Radical Undoing Yourself, R-U-D-Y, which consists of the technology of undoing the so-called chakra knots. So when the kundalini is released, you don't run into most of the problems that many people run into when fooling around with the kundalini force. And what are some of those problems? If you remember, uh, there was a book written by a psychiatrist I think it was called Kundalini or Psychosis. And then you remember the book by, uh, I think it was Gobi Krishna, right. on his experiences with Kundalini. Sometimes people use the word prana. There are two different explanations whether or not the words are equivalent. In my view, the forces are equivalent, the powers are equivalent. These are empirical, measurable forces and powers. In other words, the latest research has shown that each chakra has specific brain areas that light up when right. they are stimulated. So we're not dealing with unknowables such as angels, demons, etc. Okay, and that's what you're focusing on right now with your work, your DVDs, and uh, the books you're working on presently? That is correct. The first DVD and CD, we only sold privately through Falcon's website, www.newfalcon.com. And the second DVD is the work on the eye and face areas, or for those interested in chakra names, the Ajna area and the right. surrounding areas involved. And these are both DVDs and you also have audio CDs on Kundalini and Tantra. We have some, but we're okay. switching completely to DVD rather than doing the audio CD because it doesn't make any sense. You can't see what you're, you can't see what you're doing about. or what's going on. And I've hired inexperienced models to give demonstrations rather than experienced ones for the simple reason. Most of the students are starting from a zero base and we want to give them the idea of what happens in the progression of loosening up the so-called knots. That's what you're focusing on now. Tell us a bit about your own background and how you got started in, in working with the late and great Dr. Rigardi and um, psychology and religion. Well, my first experience with the Golden Dawn was, I believe, sometime in 63-64, when I hired a babysitter for my first alleged child and she was a member of the Golden Dawn and she introduced me into the rituals of the Golden Dawn and the Tarot. She was a follower of Waite and one of Waite's groups 
which had a base in Florida, according to her. She was highly Christian, and she had a secret temple, which she showed us, where she had hand-drawn tarot cards, all kinds of booklets, uh, that's what they were, primarily those little blue booklets little we used pamphlets. to write. Yeah. Okay. That we worked with in grammar school and high school, which contained all the rituals and much of the magic of the Golden Dawn. And from there, I continued on working with her for a time. And then uh, when she disappeared, I continued working on my own until 1970 when I met Dr. Regardi. And I worked with him until his death in 1985. Your work with him was mostly in psychology. Dr. Regardi, for those of you who don't know, held a PhD in, what was it, clinical psychology? He held a PhD, but he never used it because it was from a non-accredited university. He primarily mm -hmm. used his doctorate of chiropractic, DC, because that was an accredited, accepted doctorate degree. Here in the United States. Here in the United States. He got States. his PhD from where? Uh, he got his PhD from one of the, at that time, schools in the United States that was attempting accreditation, uh, but never made it. I so see. he rarely ever used his PhD. But he did the work for it, nonetheless. He, he did, did the work for the work it, nonetheless, and the yeah. Dissertations. Right. And he was a practicing a Reikian therapist. You know that, that was the guise upon which he worked, yes. Okay. Because that's... You, it would be difficult to put an ad in the yellow page as well. I'm a kundalini magician and I mystic. Too well. uh, that way he got enough patience, since he was a licensed chiropractor, to earn a living. However, within his regular practice, there was a secret internal practice, which consisted of a number of students who were taught some of the ancient techniques of kundalini which in fact in my view after years of study this is where Reich got his idea of orgone universal energy which right. of course is ancient right. and the methodology for what he called orgone therapy or vegetotherapy or Reichian therapy as it's now called in fact, in my view, and also in Regardi's view, most of the stuff was lifted from the Hindus and Buddhists who came to Europe during the time that he, he was there. The Theosophical Society, and they brought all of that to Europe when mm -hmm. the Buddhists came, and it sounds to me like it's just Western occultism is borrowed from Hindu philosophy and Hindu Tantra. We just took what we wanted and recycled it and borrowed it. That's true, and whether there really is a Western tradition would depend on how you want to trace that from right. the Greeks or from the Egyptians. But if you look closely at that, where were they? Where was their geography compared to right. what we call today a Western tradition? It was most everything came from that region, the Middle East, the Egyptians, the Celtic groups claim that there was a separate tradition, which I have no doubt there was. Right. But even there, when they were looking for the original Aryans, where did they send the expeditions to? Not to New York and not to Norway. They sent them where? If all of this came out of Egypt and into an early India where the Aryans were supposedly from, and they made their way into, they trickled their way really into Europe, then all of this really is coming from that whole Fertile Crescent area. The basket of the, the world. The basket of the world, basically. Mm -hmm. So you worked with Dr. Regardi in what capacity? Mostly in, in psychology and, and Tantra? Is that what you guys focused on? Or? Well, I don't like the word psychology anymore because okay. it's become a profession for housewives and a profession for politicians. They're preoccupied with what is socially acceptable now, 
In my day, it wasn't that way. I was in the era where we used LSD legally, and we did all kinds of experimental right. work. We had the nude marathons. We had all the experimental stuff, which today would be considered as politically incorrect. Or taboo or disreputable. So I gave up my licenses. Because of today's social stigma surrounding clinical psychology and all the work behind that. I advertised myself as such, but I never considered myself as one of them. I always considered myself as a teacher. I was never really interested in somebody who had a problem with their husband or wife. Clinical uh, therapy, that was... It was boring. It's nonsense. It's like being a babysitter at a psychotic camp. I mean, you know, <laughs> it never really turned me on. But that's the way one had to earn a living. And so you and Dr. Regardi really focused um, not on psychology, and I mean, that's really, as you said, a word that's misunderstood. And seems today psychologists are only interested in getting uh, their returns. It's a handmaiden of the state, so people can reproduce and have babies and consume and buy things. Well, well you yeah. and Dr. Regardi did real work concerning the human brain and our psychic makeup. That's and true. Tell me about some of your early work concerning that, concerning Kundalini and not psychology, for lack of a better word, but exploring the human brain in relation to religion and our behavior. And Dr. Rigotti wrote many gems in that regard using mysticism and the Kabbalah. Tell me about some of your early work with that. Well, first let's say that the word psychology is from the word psyche. Psyche, exactly. Right, in Greek. However, what we do is from a different word, which starts with T, thanatology, which was more concerned with what people nowadays call psychology. Actually, the psyche is more of a broad term and is more concerned with the soul and the entire makeup of man rather than just one aspect of man. You and Dr. Regardi were doing a lot of work with the human psyche and how it relates to a religion. I know Dr. Regardi was an adept of the Golden Dawn and really explored the psyche and behavior in relation to initiation and initiating into society like the Golden Dawn. So tell me a bit about your early work. If you know that when we were doing what I call chakraology, or which would he advertised as neo reikian therapy, with certain patients he was doing such things as the middle pillar while working right. with them, so he would be sending waves of energy through them, but he did not do that with most of his patients because they were regular people, and that's how he made his income. We all live in a disguise in this society, in this culture, that was his. He acted as if, and he was, a licensed chiropractor who was an expert in the body therapies. But with his more sublime clients, he would do all kinds of other things. He would actually work with them with uh, the system of mysticism and Kabbalah and, as I said, the middle pillar exercises. How did you learn from him? Well, the only way to learn is to go through it. And that was his demand. You had exactly. to go through it personally. I have a document that he signed that I went through so many hours of work in this area. I think it came out to about three and a half years before he gave me permission to go out on my own and do what I could do. Because unlike today, similar to Zen, you have to go through the process yourself before you are allowed to do anything. Today, people pick up books and they show off what they read or what they didn't read. and They believe their legends in their own mind, to borrow from Clint Eastwood's movie. Exactly, and they attach delusions of grandeur and illusionary degrees to make themselves feel better. Brought up Zen, and I 
I sat with uh, some Zen monks for a while and they would not even accept you until you had gone through a certain amount of training and then after that they would not permit you to teach until there was a, a specific, we'll call it for lack of better words, psychic religious transmission that they gave to you specifically. That's exactly true. One of Dr. Rigardi's dearest friends who I spend time with, whose first name was Henry, he's now gone, was a official Zen master and I met him and his students and in fact we traveled, Rigardi and I and one of his students, to Hawaii. She was from Switzerland and she's still alive so I won't mention her first name, but she was a Zen student of Henry's and in training. But again, you made a very valid point. Today, everyone is a star, everyone is everything, uh, everyone is equal. It's uh, not the way it is. It's and it's not the way it really is. I was not allowed to practice the secret material that he taught me until I reached a certain level of experience within that he could measure by his standards and then he allowed me to do so. He had a number of students who were in fact clinical psychologists who never received the material although they think they went through the process because he had very little regard for them and they were just patients according to him. And there's a big difference between that and actually learning from a teacher and doing. And it is work, but not work in the meaning that get up nine to five. It's also, for lack of better terms, a play in a sense. I believe that the Hindu term for that is Lila or L-I-L-A, -L divine dance or divine play. I'm not sure how exactly that translates. If you're doing it honestly, I believe that it's not work or in the sense of the term. So what you did really was work but it's something you enjoyed obviously. Well I enjoyed and suffered through because the word play in this culture tends to give the idea of purely fun and pleasure. A lot of the Kundalini Tantra Chakra work is not because no. you have resistance and to overcome the resistance you have to create a greater force and as the greater force breaks through the resistance it causes you a lot of discomfort. Methods that I use in radical undoing yourself will still will cause unpleasant results but they'll not be horrifying or permanent unpleasant results. And at the same time, for the few students I do work with directly, I do pass on an aspect of the tradition. But they have to go through the work. And you mentioned it is work, and I didn't play in the sense of let's have a good old time and play. It's work, but it's something that not only that you enjoy because it's something that you want a part of your life, obviously, to have been doing it this long. But you do go through a lot of, I'll vouch for that, you go through a lot of sufferings and uh, trials and anything that doesn't include sufferings and any type of psychological or religious work that doesn't put you through the gauntlet, so to speak, is not really worthwhile. Exactly. That's why, for an example, you will never see my series of DVDs on television being advertised because it's not right. something for the masses. I'm not trying to give you your okay you feel good and I love right. you unconditionally because that's not what I'm selling. I'm selling work for those people who are interested in doing the work. And it's years of commitment and it's costly and uh, if you want to be able to do that on other people and be responsible, then you have to go through the entire process yourself. It does take years of not only doing the work yourself and learning, but study as well. And you have to have the, the motivation enough to study 
not only with the teacher but by yourself and take it up as a form of, of sacred study where you're practicing but you're also uh, studying and a lot of people just want the practice. They want the pudding without the recipe and it's cool I get hundreds of emails oh do you believe this did you read this oh what do you think about that I don't respond or I say something very strange to these people who write me <laughs> such emails they want to engage me and they want validation or they want to prove they're smarter than I am and most of the people in this area or in fact any area are more interested in being a legend in their own mind than actually getting down and doing the dirty work. Or a legend in whatever field or genre of religion, not just the occult, but whatever religious group they're working with. Religion is the opiate of the masses. This work, what Dr. Regardi did, to me it seems like he combined these systems. He, he really explored the human psyche and what role it plays in us and the format of initiation that he went through, that he did the work on himself and the sufferings that he went through and that you've gone through under him. Now to me in the books that you've written, it seems like there's a good portion of people, a large portion, who don't want to do the work. Very few people do the work. If you remember one of Bob Wilson's books, he points that out over and over again, that he will get emails. He's already answered the questions, and they're asking him the same questions because over. they didn't read the work. And what I mean by read, one of the exercises I provide all my personal students is they get two or three books, and they're all open to page one and they're to read a paragraph of each of them every day. One paragraph or right. one page. And that's all. And within their minds, they're to analyze and compare and contrast and integrate the greatest disparities. For an example, I'll provide Science and Sanity and Matthew. And then I'll juxtapose that to a book on Physiology. I'll juxtapose that to a book on mathematics. I'll juxtapose those to, in my view, one of the most disgusting novels, Gone with the Wind. And they're to put all of this information together. I force them to use their head. If they don't do it, then they don't remain one of my students. Critical thinking is what you learn in any university or college. One would That's assume. what they advertise. So they advertise. It's not always the case, but if you find a good professor to... I've observed this myself in the work that I've done in my own personal studies. and It is work to the extent, but it's also something one should want to do. You either want to do something or you don't. You don't do it or you do. And that seems to be the case with work. I mean, some students have taken on and then leave or drop out and go about their own thing. But to really get into the work, it doesn't seem like anybody is really doing it. As you said, they're really interested in being legends in your own mind. They're interested in feeling good for exactly. a moment. They buy a program and they'll listen to it and they'll feel good and that's cool. But you can't pass that off as having done the work. It's like having a martini. It feels good for a while, and then you crash. And if you're an alcoholic, then you take another one. But the point right. is very simple. I've known people to go from one program to the next program to the next, always looking for magic, a fix, without having to put in the effort. It seems to be people just want that feeling, like you said, to feel good. They want to do a ritual or a magic or get this initiation to feel good. And that's not what it's about. If you're going to get involved in this. You better be ready to do work and, as you say, to undo yourself to do those things. Unlearn what you've learned and, and take up this work that uh, we're discussing and uh, that Regardi started and or carried on. Yeah, you see... 
you can measure brain change with MRI, et cetera, et cetera. And if you do the work, there's actually changes. The nerve fibers from the frontal lobes will grow down to the lower brain system. Because in reality, we are dominated by the lower brain system, which has more fibers ascending to the frontal lobes. You wrote a book, The Psychopath's Bible, which really stands out. You want to tell us about that? The Psychopath's Bible really, particularly if you look at the latest editions, has a gigantic amount of coursework and study to do. If you want to be superior, if you want to be better, you have to learn and you have to learn lots of different things and the book tells you how to become superior. I use the word psychopath as a substitute for the word superior person and the reason I chose that word is because so many of the great people throughout history today particularly in our climate of political inferiority we are sold an idea that all ideas, all values, everything is equal. There is nothing better than one thing than another, which is taught particularly in the universities and the Department of Sociology, which in my opinion will be non-existent within <laughs> 50 for years for the simple reason that everything is a function of the structure of the human brain. I really don't care about the subhuman or the average person. I care about the person who desires to be superior and maybe is in a certain sense, but doesn't have the tools to become that way. And I provide techniques and work within that book to help them start along this process. Now, they can do this all by themselves, but if, if they want to work with me personally, which some do, they have to do it under my direction and the way I tell them. I do not put up with arguments or discussions. I'm not running an egalitarian university. I'm running a dictatorship. This is what I know works. If you want to do it, do it. If you don't, go somewhere else. But the Psychopath Bible, some people have been panicked by the name, yeah, Psychopath. Some people have even turned the book into the federal government. Uh, I'm sure you enjoyed that. Yeah, that was fun. However, they saw that it was truly benign. I mean, I'm not out to overthrow any of their silly systems. I'm simply providing information and techniques for those individuals who feel they want to be better than the common flock and who uh, are willing to spend the time doing the work to accomplish that. A lot of people don't when they get involved in this and sadly a lot of people associate this work with the occult and magic and that's interesting on the outset it's attractive and sexy and mysterious. How do we separate this? from magic and, and the occult and all that nonsense. Because this is real physical and physiological and psychic work. That's true. You can do, and I have practiced all of these things and experimented with them because my position is, is if I don't do it, I don't know it. So I have done hundreds and hundreds of rituals I am a high-level initiate in a number of organizations. I have, in fact, co-started one with another individual using my lineage, or misusing my lineage. That's a better term for it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of experience in the so-called occult and right. the so-called initiations. It's a peak experience to be initiated. But a peak experience does not make a day. And it doesn't make a permanent change in your fundamental makeup. It may make a 
change. Like a small imprint. Yeah, that's all. And I've officiated at numerous initiations and have been through so many myself, I hate to even remember them. <laughs> and also have performed numerous rituals with very high ranking adepts. And it's cool. It's a nice experience, right, it's like going sexy to the amusement yeah, park and, and getting that thrill. Yeah. But you gotta come the down thrill. to earth. You gotta come point. down to earth and apply everything you do, more or less, each and every day. Yeah, every day is the key. What Dr. Rigardi was doing, and the books he wrote, was he really wanted to separate himself from that stigma. There was a great quote in one of the books. He said, I, some, sometimes I just wish the whole occult and Crowley and all that would just go the hell away. And I could really sympathize with that. Yeah, we had a box of letters, a gigantic box. Right. Of letters and we were going to do a book called Liber Nuts. <laughs> the Book <Excuse> of <laughs> Nuts. It would have been fascinating to do it but even though legally the letters belonged to him because they were sent to him we could not according to our lawyers publish the book without being open to tremendous litigation so we didn't and after his death, I destroyed the entire collection of thousands of letters sure, from fruitcakes. <laughs> and I always say in any interview I do, don't write me an email and ask me for the secret name of your angel. <laughs> I mean, please. Is there a real need to filter all that out, all the occult and all that you know, schlemiel of magic? Or does it hold any value whatsoever? As a peak experience, yes. But a, that's a religion, all. an initiation has a peak experience value. And that's good to have. But if you take it too seriously or you take it too personally, you're going to simply be, again, a legend in your own mind. It's not going to make a major change in your life. As a rule, a few people it has. But well, how has it? After the initiation, they went off and they worked their butt off. That mystic experience that you know, many of these adepti throughout the ages have verified on their, their own systems and within systems, have, they've had that peak experience and gone on to do the work though. It seems to me that the high, the addiction of getting that experience has really made the whole thing a big, giant rot, a corpse. It's a collector of dust. It collects much dust, but every once in a while you'll find a particle here or there that is of true value who our culture and society, and I use those as catchphrases, have rejected. There's no place for this person in the normal world. And what you do, much like what Rigardi did, is you get a profession so you can make an income and then you continue on doing your work. But these people are few and far between. Very few and far between. And you keep on doing your research. There's a number of people I have met over how many years, say from the mid-60s to now, what, 40-some years. But the number compared to the overall number of people who are interested is less than 1%. Well, Rajneesh said in a major lecture he gave, 5% of you here are right. worth something. 95% of you here are to support the 5% who are worth something. However, everyone in the audience thought they were in the 5%. Everybody thought they were in the 5%. Right. I was listening to a lecture by Robert Anton Wilson the other day. He said there was a story, I think it was, yeah, he was talking about Rajneesh. Uh, that one day he said, well, I'm going to get all my disciples to wear orange. And that works, and everybody's going to, who wants this holy secret, my holy teaching, must wear orange. So they did that, and he said, okay. And Dr. Wilson said, five years later, he came back and said, now I want you all to wear purple. And they all changed from orange to purple. And he said, well, hot damn, five years later, he came back and he said, I want you all to buy me Rolls Royces. And he's got a dozen of them. And <laughs> that really seems to be, <laughs> to be fitting in, uh, in this realm of work.
You're either doing the work or you're not. You either master yourself or you don't. And it is 1%. But why do you think that is? I think it's Failure. brain damage. Brain damage. Th those of us who are in the work are brain damaged in a different way than the average right. person. And that's why I said somewhere, and people flipped out, is that I'm all for brain damage. <laughs> <laughs> because if it's normality is what it's supposed to be, according to them, uh, I'd rather be brain damaged. And I am. No <laughs> question about Aren't it. Aren't we all? Many people have said I'm brain damaged. I must be doing something, right? And you've had countless... People say countless uh, devious and dastardly things about you, <laughs> but those those are people who are sheep, basically the normal person. And what's in the occult? That's why people get into it, is it not? To get that normalcy away from them, to get that peak experience. I'm not normal anymore because I did this initiation or I have this experience or my totally Well, if totally some people make and identify, they never have been normal. That's why they went in it to begin with, but now they can put a label on it. But now it is normal, though. I'm a first degree. Well, it's normal within that group who okay. are interested in that. For example, the group of born-agains, that's a separate group, and they have leaders, and these people are the top of their so-called spiritual hierarchy and they're in charge and they have a closer connection to the insights and the future of the universe and the human race. But it's always in nature there's a hierarchy. No matter okay. whether you're Karl Marx or Adolf Hitler, there's always a hierarchy and you could go through all the teachings you wish and nature is smart enough not to make everything the same. Because just in case there is a calamity, there has to be enough variance within any system for a part of that system to survive. You can have all the delusions you want of normality, of what is right and what is wrong, and there will always be enough variability within the schemata so that if you had another ice age, or if you had another warm age, something would survive of this particular genetic coil. Now, people are shocked right now over this whole idea of global warming. I mean, they're acting as if they have no sense of history. We had a minor ice age, what, four or five hundred years ago in Europe and so-called United States, and 10,000 years ago, 20,000, 30, Species come and go. There's nothing so marvelous about us <laughs> that we have to be here. Yeah. Actually, Rigardi hoped that we'd all <laughs> die and something better would come. He found us rather disgusting, and I agree with him. Rather loathsome, disgusting group of yeah, monkeys. <laughs> I call us the fifth great ape. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, the dinosaurs had their time. It's like that movie, The Matrix, as a character was saying. You're a disease. You go wherever you want. You reproduce. And uh, you had your time. Buzz off. It's all Buzz time. off, right. Bye. Where does the top of the hierarchy fit in, then? Within this... any particular system, there's right. always a top of the hierarchy. And even between the lowest people, there is the top person on that the low chain. People. You can make all the laws you want. You can talk all you want, words are very dangerous because it gives you the illusion that you have free will when in fact <laughs> you're just replicating you're just a replicating system in space that you have a mind of your own is another illusion, that you're really an individual is another illusion that's the biggest, free will is the biggest farce in yeah, the whole universe. biggest farce of all. <laughs> and there's a particular group out there I forgot their name do what thou wilt oh my shall God, be the whole no. of the law I would simply translate it, do what you must is what happens. I find them disgusting. I too was once a member just to learn more about them. But, I'm going to throw uh, up real quick. <laughs> no, please, dear. We don't have a mop handy. And they think they created such a phrase, or Diogenes, and the Greeks in 400 BC were using <laughs> such phrases of your so-called true will. 
place. True will really means nothing more than your biological inclination. Your function, really. Yeah. But not just your biological function, but as you can, can you apply the psychophysiological function in that as well? Or? Those are just arbitrary words, but yeah, inevitably it works down to the fundamental molecular level, like at the molecular level, right. death cells. Basically, yeah. Yes, okay, Survival and most people don't, oh my god, they're death cells! Yeah, <laughs> some of them are programmed to go off when the cancer is around, so they kill cancer. Oh my god, they're killing cancer! Oh, it's homicide! <laughs> How do you think a cancer feels? From its point of view, don't you think it feels like somebody is killing it? Basically, yeah. Yeah, don't, don't you feel sorry for it? Yeah, I really do. I mean, I do uh... too. I mean, I think about it all day long. You know, it's being murdered! Murder! Murder! Cole Whitehouse! I mean, seven billion monkeys running around. I cheer for cancer and disaster. Yes! And it, Let's it, hope for chaos and for disaster. It. And with Katrina, I almost... He almost greatest. had an orgasm. Oh my god, it was awesome. Wasn't it a wonderful <laughs> experience? Was cool. It was similar to an epiphany. <laughs> it was, really. That was something in 9-11, too. And like you said, it's the top of the hierarchy, and it's survival of the fittest. Now that's actually Spencer, which is not what Darwin meant. What survives is what survives. To say it was the fittest actually relates to the that. environment. Right. Exactly. Actually relates to the environment which initiated that which survived. So besides being a tautology in Spencerism, which most idiots adopt and ruin the understanding of Darwinism, that which survives, survives. The fact that you say it's the best, uh, that which survives, survives. Because, you see, you have to you know, watch well, out for otherworldly right? terms. Human terms do not exist independent of humans. We invent them and then act as if I they mean, were invented somewhere else. What is the point of the work? To become superior and to reach the top of whatever hierarchical system you're working with and to get money and women and followers, but to evolve into a superior type of being or for the hell of it. Well, for some of us, the point of the work is we really have no other option. We're not designed to fit in to Normalcy, the 68% yeah. Of the population, so in a lot of sense, we can say we really don't have much of a choice. We either do something or we die out. For other people, they do it because they like it and they want to learn because it gives them not only information and knowledge and wisdom and understanding, it also gives them a feeling of purposefulness which is what all human beings at one level or another claim they want. Most people accept right. normal purposefulness, which is, as I say it, reproduce, consume, and die. So I was, for an example, visiting a friend at a hotel last night in Phoenix, and all you could see is the same things. A father with a mother, with Two three kids. children and they're all wearing the same clothes, they're all pushing the same cart, they're all doing the same thing, and they all think they're individuals, they all think this is unique. For me, <laughs> it's unique for me. Now, as soon as they say the word me, then I got him because that's all there is to it, is me, 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 me. But me is DNA. Exactly, and you see it on the university too. It's all I see is people trying to be individual and unique, but they're all doing the same thing, looking the same way, and thinking the same way. And it's really not hard to outthink many of your professors. And if you are listening, I'm sorry, you don't know who I am. I don't want to fail your course, but. <laughs> Political correctness at the <laughs> university has become a common pathology. Everyone suffers from it. In my day, if you were doing research in an area that may be disapproved of, you may have gotten a slap on your hand, but you still got to do it. Nowadays, you have to be very, very, very careful what you do. I know so many people that did not get their PhD 
because they were doing research that was politically incorrect. Nowadays, it's much easier to get a master's than in the old days. When I got my first master's, half the class flunked the comprehensives. Fifty percent of, say, a hundred students did not pass. And once you were done with that, then you had a real thesis. And you had to go in front of a real committee. But now there's a violation of her femininity, violation of his homosexuality. So all you have to do is just pull any card out of the deck you want because you are personally incompetent or your committee is incompetent. Today, a person with a PhD is equivalent to a person with a bachelor's degree from the 1950s. Yeah, back then those degrees meant something. They meant something. Today, because of all the political correctness and all the restrictions, I tell students, just get your degree, get out, and then do what you want. Don't sit around there and try to change the world at your doctoral level because in all probability you'll never make it out of the hole. That's kind of pointless to do. Yeah. Do a dissertation, get your degree, smile, shake hands, say ciao, and then go out and do whatever the hell you want to do. As the work that you and Dr. Rigardi did is, uh, it's unique and it's not only something that it's, you guys have been doing, but it's been passed on. And it's to really rise above your idea of normalcy and being stuck in the mud. It's empiric, that is, it's measurable. If I can't measure it, I don't want it. And there are results that can be measured. Exactly. Regardi has right. done it, he's done the results, he's measured the results. Right. He's done it. And what have you seen so far with your work? Well, the students that stuck things out, we've seen major changes in their lives and major changes in how they feel about themselves. And those are measurable and relatively permanent. In other words, they're not just placebo effects, which usually go away within six weeks. Well, the people who are really interested, uh, what do you want them to really get out of it? What did Regardi want? Inevitably, that's always an unknown, by definition. If you're doing the real work, what you're going to find out, quote, at the end, unquote, is unknowable at the beginning. There is really no end to it. Yeah, but there are stages right. of right. ends, if you would. And you might say plateaus where you can see more distance and more land and more ocean because you're higher. But how that is for you specifically is an unknowable. For a specific person that right. is unknowable, unless I would see them, and one has to be careful in letting other people know what you see because that can get your head chopped off. You start on the journey and there are many places to rest, much like going on a highway, and you may rest here and believe that's the end of the journey and stay there, or you may rest and then move on to the next place and keep on moving until you reach, you might say, a stop that gives you a much broader perspective. But our life is too short to go too far too quickly, so we must start as early as possible. Certain brain cells stop developing and growing at a certain age, and therefore it's much harder to make changes than it was when you were younger. Other brain cells keep on going and you can make changes with those. But again, I am very empirical. I stick as close to what I can observe as possible. And this is one reason why they say don't expect to be loved unconditionally by Dr. Hyatt. <laughs> Although he does love you but at a distance, a very far distance. But we're not here to be mushy and lovey. There's enough of that in the world anyways. You can see how much good it's done. Yeah, really, most of it's a joke. 
what did Regardi want out of his work? He wanted the information to be continued to be passed on in the simplest sense, including some of the nonsense in the Golden Dawn and the non-nonsense in the Golden Dawn, and including a lot of the material we were doing in Kundalini and Tantra and Chakraology to be left behind. He told me to make sure that enough Golden Dawns, for an example, got to the Southern Hemispheres because he was very dubious that the Northern Hemispheres would survive for any period. And I, I've carried out basically everything he asked me to carry out for him. I, for one, am not that enthralled with the outcomes I've seen from Golden Dawn or oh, any of that work. However, a lot of the techniques are useful, but they're borrowed from numerous sources. And in essence, it's not a inherently complete system because it's borrowed from here, dither, wither, and shither, and then together. And I think it's useful and fun and interesting to be an initiate of the Golden Dawn if you take it seriously, do your work, and have some fun along the way. I have three things. Make some money, have some fun, and do a little good along the way. Don't do too much, otherwise they'll kill yeah, you. Yeah, that's they'll shoot you, or persecute you, or God knows what. You know him personally. And yeah, work. we lived together for years. What did he really wish to be remembered by from people who are, like yourself, interested and thankful for what he gave to us? I think for his methodology, like the middle pillar, in a lot of ways he didn't want to be remembered at all. Really? Yeah, just, just to be oblivion because he thought the people that would remember him are not worthy of remembering anything. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. I mean, not remembering in sense of idolizing, but as far as the work he did. In time, it'll all be washed out. More likely that a creep character like Crowley will be remembered oh. because he shit on people's floors <laughs> than Regardi, who did a lot of word, useful doctor. things. It's a C word, yes. But you got a bunch of spoiled children out there who want to join that kind of organization and poo poo here and <laughs> throw temper tantrums in the street. Let them do it. Yeah, we're wrapping up, so why not just let it all out? This is Illuminati Coast to Coast, and I don't really give a crap what they think. So let it all spill out. Well, I, I sort of just said enough, I think. They're all spoiled children, and when I even mention it in universities, I, my professors give me the slip, huh? What are you talking? Are you? They give me that, you know, special handicap look. Well, I first learned about the creature in a English literature class. Wow. They were comparing the poetry of Yeats with... The Golden Dawn Boys. Yeah, they said, oh, he's a, he was a minor poet in that tradition, whatever that meant. That's how I first heard of him. They think he was a major poet and better than the Yeats, and uh, in my opinion, uh, that's the biggest joke of them all. <laughs> that's a load of crap. He was no intellectual giant, and uh, frankly, in my opinion, created no new psychotechnology to help people, as regarding himself had done. Yourself as well. And myself is well. It's been a privilege and honor to interview. I hope to get you back sometime in the near future or in some other form when we break out of the matrix. Sounds good to me. Let's all have a good time in the meantime and do our work and stop writing me emails about the secret names of your angels. I'm sorry. I won't do that anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> know the name of my angel, but we're going to wrap it up. Are we supposed to sing? The song. The song. We forgot the song. Taking it in the shoot in a Cairo motel. Taking it in the shoot in a Cairo motel. Brown water. Brown water. Amen. I roll. 
This says Illuminati Coast to Coast. It's been a distinct privilege and honor to interview Dr. Hyatt. For Dr. Hyatt, sorry Nana, I'm Joshua Seraphim. Tune in or tune out.